Today, asking for your guidance, wisdom, and support as we begin this meeting. Help us engage in a meaningful discussion. Allow us to grow as a community and fill us with your grace. We ask these things in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. All right, thank you very much. Uh, we have a quorum this evening. Uh, thank you, commissioners. Uh, let's see, announcements. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a couple announcements. Your next meeting in your um, planning update, I had noted two cases. One was a, um, a private school in Zoan Church, and the other one was St. Patrick's, an expansion to that existing church and school. And the St. Patrick's case is not ready. We couldn't advertise it in time. So that one will move till the, probably the first meeting in April. Um, but we will continue to have the Zoan case at your next meeting. Another update, um, Ms. Carter, you had asked about the growth rate and the 70-30 split. Um, I had mentioned last time that our growth rate was at 1.7%. And once the census comes out with updated population estimates, uh, which happens in the springtime. I'll be updating that again to bring it forward. Um, so I'll report again at that point as to where we are. But at this point in time, our number is 1.7% annual growth rate. And it's a, uh, I believe that we have part of Marshall plan that says 2% growth. Is that still saying? No, that was removed from the comprehensive plan. Okay. The last update removed that. Okay. That's okay. Yes. I, I didn't see that, and I was wondering who removed that. And then the 70-30, that still is in our comprehensive plan, and, and what that is is a goal to achieve our tax base at 30% non-residential and 70% residential tax base. And at last year, the split was about 19% non-residential and 81% residential. That will be updated when the land book is closed in April, and I'll be able to provide updated figures bringing it forward a year at that point in time as well. We need a lot more non-residential <laughs> to add to the tax base. But that's another item that, that has come up in discussion. Um, I know the board has brought it up and asking, well, what's the basis for the 70-30, you know, should, should we re-examine that? Because really, when you look back in time, I guess that uh, probably the closest we came was 77-22. And that was in 2010, just looking back to 1995 here. And, and is, is, is that truly a good measure, or should we consider you know, a different measure? So that's something that we'll look at during our comprehensive plan update. I believe that every rezoning that we do commercial. And I don't know how we're falling behind. And are we not requiring enough commercial? Do we need to require more when we do rezoning? Well, I think it's just so much of it's market driven as to, well, you know, as, as to what is supported and what can be built. And so. I think, you know, it's a good topic for discussion as we move through the comprehensive plan update. If, excuse me, if you please, yes. Chair, I'd like to ask Wanda a question. You said that 2% growth rate that was in our comprehensive plan, that's been removed? Correct. There, there was a uh, goal to achieve a 2% growth rate, and that was put in when the growth rate was higher. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so we're down below 2%, and there was at the last planning commission, or excuse me, at the last uh, comprehensive plan update, um, the feeling was that that 2% growth rate was no longer an appropriate goal. When, uh, my question follow up is uh, what implications does that have on our growth? I mean, does it give somebody an open door to, to grow as fast as we want to? Or Because a lot of people thought that that 2% was a goal we had to shoot for. That's right. And they wanted to fulfill 2% growth every year. Right. We didn't go over it either. Right. Right. We could handle the two percent. Right. But that was the study showed that that's where it should stay at two percent. That two percent at that point in time was seen as a sustainable growth rate, and right. 
and above it would be potentially growing too quickly. And, so and now we, we don't have a growth rate, but so uh, we don't what have, are the implications? Right. We don't necessarily have a growth rate goal. Um, you know, we'd, we'd been down around 1%, hanging right around 1% for several years. Now we're yeah. up to about one7 um, you know, and again, another topic that we could discuss during the comprehensive plan update. I couldn't tell you right now, you know, what the implications are yeah, if I'm, we don't have one. Just so uh, there's no danger lurking, I'm good with it all. Right, right. So, you know, if, if, if we start growing mm -hmm. like we were in the early 2000s, yeah, you that's know, when and okay. that's when it was put in place. So now that our growth rate is progressing upward, you know, it might be something to consider, you know, what is a sustainable growth rate and how do we want to achieve that? Right. Thank you. Any other questions or announcements? All right, moving on to the next item on the agenda is review and approval of the minutes of February 21st, 2017. I trust all commissioners have had a chance to review those. If there are no questions or comments on that, I will take a motion to approve. Move to approve. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. Uh, next item is the um, unfinished business for the comprehensive plan amendments, CPA 17-0003. Thank you. This is the comprehensive plan amendment that adds three sentences to the comprehensive plan within two sections. Uh, one section is the introduction and vision. There are two sentences there. And then land use, there's a sentence added in there. A public hearing was held on February the 7th, and that public hearing was closed. There are a number of citizens that spoke that evening. Um, they, a lot of them were speaking about a specific project and what staff did was listen to the questions in terms of general comments that um, were applicable to this proposed comprehensive plan amendment. And so the question that uh, the Planning Commission asked of staff is to review the language and determine if it's appropriate and sufficient to address the types of concerns that were raised by the citizens this e that evening. The specific policies that are proposed to be added are um, within the introduction and vision section I mentioned there are two. There is one related to Spotsylvania County as a business friendly community and local job creation as a priority and the proposed addition is a policy that says encourage innovative land uses such as renewable energy generation, data processing centers and other industries leveraging technology and in fields including but not limited to information technology, medicine and logistics. So, while this does include renewable energy generation, we took the opportunity to look forward at some other types of um, business growth that is emerging and becoming um, more popular and, and we may see in the future. The second one is related to agriculture and silviculture being valued components of Spotsylvania County's economy. And this proposed addition says encourage complementary land uses such as agritourism, agribusiness, and renewable energy generation in agricultural and rural areas. Uh, so within this introduction and vision section, there are um, two more broad policies proposed to be added. And then within the land use chapter, there is a more specific one related to renewable energy generation facilities. And it says that these facilities, including solar, geothermal, or wind, should be sited and designed to minimize detrimental impacts to neighboring properties, uses, and roadways. And we're talking about properties, we're talking about land, water, air, anything about your property. If, if you have a well and something happens to your, the, the aquifer that then affects your well, that affects your property. So we're not just talking about the land, we're talking about the air, the land, the water underneath. Uh, uses, what we're referring to there are such things as a school or a farm use or a residential use, whatever that property is used for. And then of course roadways, that, that's fairly obvious. The comprehensive plan is intended to be general in nature and that's in accordance with the Code of Virginia. It is a long-range vision for the county and contains policies related to future development. And because of this, 
general nature of the plan, staff believes that the language as it was originally proposed is, is appropriate. And to explain that a little bit more, I'd like to just review some of the regulations. The, the, the plan is an overall policy, and there are a host of regulations and laws, essentially, that, that come into play when reviewing uh, renewable energy facilities. So in the bottom box that's in blue, those are a list of ordinances that are in place that everybody has got to meet no matter whether you're, you're building by right or otherwise. That, those are all local ordinances within the county. The red box above that is another layer of regulation, and that's the special use permit. And solar energy facilities require a special use permit in the agricultural and rural districts. And then beyond that is an extra layer of regulation that was put in place in November of 2017, and that is our solar ordinance. So that recognizing that solar energy facilities are really very different and, and unique compared to the types of industries that we've had in this county, and the impacts um, that they have are going to be different, and the way we should evaluate them perhaps should be different than a lot of other special uses that we typically see. Um, that is the reason that um, we in put in place a specific solar ordinance. So, you know, it, it looks at things like decommissioning plans, which we wouldn't look at that for another type of special use. Um, so there are these multiple layers of regulations. Uh, so, so this, the comprehensive plan is the should. It, it's aspirational. This is the shall. This is the requirement. So special uses, just to look at them a little more closely, um, they have unique characteristics or potential impacts on surrounding neighborhood and the county as a whole that require individual consideration of their design, configuration, and or operation. And as a result of that, individualized conditions can be placed on that special use permit when it's approved. So how do the comprehensive plan and the ordinance work together? The comprehensive plan provides that policy support for those conditions. So while we may have a stormwater management ordinance that says you need to deal with your, the, water, the stormwater on your site, it doesn't say things like, but you cannot have a holding pond any closer than 100 feet to that adjacent property. So it's those individualized considerations that come out in the review that are the concern and the issue that in the comp plan where we have that very specific statement that talks about minimizing detrimental impacts on neighboring properties that then provides support for the resulting conditions that might be applied to a special use. And of course, that the, the policy within the comprehensive plan ultimately m could end up with a denial for an application as well. If in the end, the county feels that there is just no way to mitigate the detrimental impacts of a proposed use at its proposed location, then of course that provides the support for the denial. So just wanted to run through how the, the ordinance and the comprehensive plan work together um, to result in um, the outcome of a special use. So with that, staff does recommend approval of CPA 17-0003 and comprehensive plan Amendments uh, do require resolutions. So there's a resolution at your place um, if you'd refer to that when you take your vote. And the uh, the task before us this evening is to bring the comprehensive plan amendment in alignment with the ordinance. It's supportive of the ordinance. It's supportive of the ordinance. Yes, it's supportive of the ordinance. It's not required by the ordinance, okay. um, but it provides that policy support. All right. And uh, at this point, are there any questions or comments at this point? Um, uh, I, I want to move this forward um, and get it to the uh, Board of Supervisors. Um, I support the staff's recommendation uh, for approval um, with the, <clears throat> you know, the uh, comments and, and uh, questions brought forth by the citizens at the public hearing were very valid and uh, great questions, and it is, it is those questions that will be answered at site plan application time. 
or actually they will be answered during the special use review. Special use yes. review, so that's the yes. opportunity to review each application. On it. That's correct. Um, we'll be evaluating the types of um, concerns and items that were being brought forth at the public comment period and uh, evaluating those and making recommendations to the Planning Commission and Board when the, that case comes to, uh, okay. when it's, it, it's not complete yet at this point in time. So first it needs to be de deemed complete and then we can continue with our review and it will move forward through the public hearing process. All right, very well. Any other questions or comments at this point? I just have one. Yes, ma'am. Um, Wanda, um, I know we voted you know, two, 200 acres and more special use permit, you know, et cetera. What, can one of these be as large as, I mean, this is quite a huge that we have been, you know, introduced to. And so there's no limit on how big, how large they can be or has, you know, is there anything at all that would require something like that? No, not, not in our ordinance. There's no cap on the size of an application, no. And I'm not sure if that would even be legal right. to That's cap my question. Is an there, application is it? size. There is nothing that I know of at the moment that would allow for a cap. But if you want me to research that, I will. But I don't know of anything off the top of my head. I'd like to know sometime, okay? I mean, that's not necessary tonight, but... And uh, Wanda, for the motion, I have to read, somebody has to read in this uh, resolution? Is it either read? Or, read? or the, the motion, um, actually, the, uh, well, the motion could simply be to recommend approval um, as noted in the resolution. All right, y yes, I will, I will do that. Um, the chair moves to um, recommend approval of CPA 17-0003 as noted in the resolution. Second. All, any other questions or comments? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, opposed. Motion passes, thank you very much. Moving on to the next item, we have a, um, <clears throat> on the agenda's discussion items. Uh, this is reconsideration of the consistency with the comprehensive plan for the social services VDH building and amendments to the planning commission. You gonna handle both of those together? Um. Yeah. Okay. The floor is yours. All right. Thank you. So in February, the, there was a CIP discussion February the 7th with the Planning Commission that focused on a new building, new construction of a new building for social services and health. Um, the Planning Commission had a number of questions, including the need for a new building versus existing space, investigating non-county vacant space, and ultimately, the Planning Commission voted to find the social services building inconsistent with the comprehensive plan. Um, since then, just wanted to bring you up to date. The board has had several work sessions to discuss the CIP, and the social services building in particular has been brought up several times. The board does have similar questions to what the Planning Commission raised, uh, looking at county space, looking at the Marshall Center, looking at leasing versus owning and, and is there uh, a benefit to leasing? And also they questioned, can we simply put money in the CIP to put towards a future facility, but not make the decision at this point in time as to exactly what that facility is gonna be and continue to study the options. Um, so that is a possibility as well. So, so these discussions will continue. I think the board has uh, an, another discussion next week, Tuesday, and then it'll continue right on through until the um, CIP adoption. Uh, what the Planning Commission is tasked with is what's called a 2232 review, and that just references the state code section. And the question before the Planning Commission is, the general or approximate location, character, and extent substantially in accord with the adopted comprehensive plan. The, what makes the social services building, I think, a little bit difficult is that it's not specifically discussed in the comprehensive plan. So, so you're really looking for language within the plan that's m much more general. Whereas when we have a fire station, we have level of service standards, we have uh, proximity standards, so there are, there are ways to measure an appropriate location for a new uh, fire station. 
Um, there's some general guidance, and one of them that I keyed in on was to provide community facilities and services to serve existing and new development in an efficient and cost-effective manner. Um, so I wanted to just kind of run through the way staff is evaluating this. Um, within the public facilities element, uh, there is a section that talks about general criteria, and some of the key ones relate to location, accessibility, and proximity. And uh, just looking at social services, they are very much customer oriented. Uh, their location, they need to be proximate to the population served. And the population served is basically the whole county. Uh, accessibility, you know, arterial road, a good route, along a Fred bus route would, would be very important. And then um, proximity, they work very closely with, with the courts, um, with public safety and the health department. Um, so these are the types of things, just looking at where would a good location be. These are the types of things that make them function efficiently. The um, Planning Commission keyed in on the new building, and one of the other criteria is, um, is related to, or there is actually not, it's not a criteria, but there is another statement in here related to addressing new needs through existing facilities wherever possible. So the Planning Commission felt that that, that that needed to be more thoroughly vetted in order to determine are there existing facilities out there, whether they are county owned or not county owned, um, that could house the social, social services um, department in a cost effective way and balance with the, that efficient provision of services as well. Um, what the Planning Commission has done in the past, um, I don't recall exactly what facility it was, but a number of years ago there was a facility that, that the Planning Commission said, well, yes, it's obviously consistent with the comprehensive plan, the location's consistent, but we have these same types of concerns. We're, we're, we're not sure that this is the uh, appropriate way to fund the, the facility or we're not sure that it, this is cost effective. So what the Planning Commission did was kind of break it out into um, two pieces. And in this case, what I'm wondering if the Planning Commission would consider is to say, yes, the courthouse area is generally in accord with the comprehensive plan. Locating social services here, not in a new building necessarily, I'm just saying locating social services in the courthouse area is generally in accord with the comprehensive plan. But a new building should only pursued after effective op options to ensure it is caught cost effective, preparing options to ensure it is cost effective. Um, so this, this is the type of uh, guidance that the Planning Commission has provided to the board in the past. And so I was just wondering if the Planning Commission um, would be willing to reconsider the, their sort of straight denial uh, to give the board a, a little more context of the situation. Uh the Planning Commission would be willing to reconsider the motion uh, or this uh, particular item. However, um, I don't think we're prepared to at, at this particular time. And what I would like to do, <clears throat> as a little backdrop, I met with uh, staff and social services staff, what was it, last week? Uh, I forget which. And in particular, in particular to uh, the social services building, it's clear to me that the space is needed. However, the analysis still isn't complete yet. And in our bylaws, we have these standing committees that I would like to go through that avenue to study exactly what you're saying and then come back to the full commission with a recommendation. Mm -hmm. So that's how I would like to proceed with this. And if the other commissioners um, support that, we can what I'd like to do is assign commissioners to the respective committees and then task them with looking at, one of them being the Capital Improvements Committee, uh, looking at this specifically. And if, uh, if staff is willing to uh, accommodate that, I think we could uh, you know, bring, this, bring this forward again. Certainly open to bringing it forward. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure what, how to facilitate that. Um, whether we, I, I prefer not to take a motion tonight because we're not prepared, but at the appropriate time, bring it back and then we can have a, 
you know, a good discussion and a, and a thorough understanding of where we are with everything. Does that sound? Yes. Um, we'll look into, I guess we need to just figure out what the scope of the committee is going to be and, and, and figure out how it's going to operate. Those types of things just um, want to nail that down before it, it's brought forward to make it official. So right. We can understand. I, that. I agree. Uh, in the bylaws, the, um, the, the policy or the basis of which the, com the committees are to function is clearly stated in my opinion, but yes, in particular to this, the CIP, I would think that the scope needs to be uh, ferreted out. So um, <clears throat> is there anything else on this at this time or? Uh, no, not at this time. Okay, so uh, what I will do um, is I will be contacting the committee members um, for their interest in a particular assignment. If there are none, I will make those assignments. And then um, I would uh, be uh, coordinating with you on staff assignment uh, to each committee. I think that would be appropriate. Any other discussion items on this item? All right, we'll move on to the uh, next one. All right, the, uh, the bylaws. The copy, the paper copy before you is updated. <clears throat> um, Alexandra had a chance to look through it and add some additional edits uh, to this version on top of the ones that were in your packet. Um, so I'd like to just quickly run through them to see if there is anything else uh, that the Planning Commission would like to have changed in here. What we'll do then is uh, finalize them so you can vote on them maybe at your next meeting. Um, but a lot of the changes you can see is there, there's just capitalization, making it Planning Commission consistent, making it Chairman consistent throughout the... the um, the item, uh, you know, it, it just had incorrect, some incorrect, uh, it says the presiding of officer and um, it's really just the planning director that would call for nominations for the election of the chair. Uh, so a lot of very simple changes uh, throughout it. So I'm going to skip through a lot of it um, because it's not substantive. Okay, one, one change that we made here was just to acknowledge that the parliamentary procedure right. is overarching as Robert's Rules of Order for the whole meeting because it really, it spoke to it related to voting. So I did remove it from, from voting since, simply because it, it's an overarching item here. I did change the order of business to reflect the order of business um, that the Planning Commission has been following. Added in the announcements as a, an official part. Um, we, we changed unfinished business. It said unfinished business from the corresponding meeting of the previous month. And I, there's no real reason to limit it so explicitly. Right. The... Um, We did take out the part about the address, that when people come to speak before the Planning Commission, they no longer are required, they would no longer be required to state their address, simply their voting district. We did have a, um, a statement in here that says that persons speaking in favor shall be called to speak, followed by those in opposition, and the Planning Commission hasn't followed that procedure, just calls for people that wish to comment. Uh, the the voting we ended up changing it to simply make it consistent with the code um, for rezonings and special use uh, voting once a public hearing is closed the commission has 60 days to vote on an item and pass it on to the board of supervisors so we simply made it consistent with the code rather than stipulating um, that voting may take place on the day of the hearing or at the next meeting 
Acts allows up to 60 days. Uh, this is an old practice that, that we had related to preliminary plats. So I just removed that since we no longer have, follow that schedule. And that really is the end of it. Back on the um, public hearing process, <clears throat> Uh, is, there a, is there a particular example or is there something that you could cite where we may want to go with those in favor first? And is there a disadvantage to taking it out is my question. Can you think of anything I... Would it be I, advantageous I, for larger, more sensitive applications to follow that or yeah, would we be... Yeah. I can recall when I first started working for the county, that practice was followed. Um, and I think the only thing that made it maybe a little easier was in the minutes to simply have all the people speaking in favor or grouped together versus all opposed or grouped together. But you also do end up with somebody that just wants to make a, a they may not be necessarily in favor or against, but they have a comment or a concern or a question. So where do they fit? I, I, I personally have not noticed any issue with simply allowing people to come up and speak whether in favor or against I don't any either. point I just, in the process. Yeah, I don't either. I'm just wondering about the unintended consequences if we change that, if there's anything that we can think of at this point. that I, would... I can't think of anything. I don't know, okay. if Alexandra, if you have any thoughts on that, any experience with that otherwise. I actually don't, and given that Given that we've been taking people in the order that they sign up, and it doesn't seem to have had a, any kind of negative effect, um, I, I don't think there's a risk. The other, the other thing, you you always have the ability to amend the bylaws. If you find that you would like to go back to um, a process, and the sheet can be created where, if you're speaking in the affirmative or in the negative uh, to a public hearing or an issue, you can go ahead and do that. Yeah. Okay. That. that and one other thing is in the bylaws, we did leave the section in there that says that the order of the speakers may be altered uh, by a majority of the planning commission voting okay. to put uh, not more than five speakers at a time speaking in, speaking in support or opposition. So maybe if there was a very large case and you wanted you know, to allow everybody to okay. have equal opportunity, um, that, that could be put into place. I believe, Mr. Chairman, Yes, that what happened was that a lot of times people will come early, whether they're for or against it. And then if they have to wait for everyone that's going to speak in favor of it, and then maybe they're going to speak against it, then it wasn't any use for them to come early. And a lot of people uh, had children who were in sports or something that they needed to do, and that's where the conflict came in at. Yeah. I recall, uh, I guess when I first started on the commission, we followed that for a brief period of time and then got away from it. And I'm, you know, I'm fine with the process. I just, you know. The only other question I had was if we get rid of the address and people don't know their voting district, how, how, do, well, how compliant are there, we? Well, there's a map out front that maybe we can, People often arrive before the meeting, and maybe we can just talk to people and say, hey, do you know your voting district? And, well, and, and give I think them that's important, um, either the address yeah. or the, or the uh, if we're taking the address out, I think it's important they know their voting district. Would you prefer to say address or voting district? I, I'm fine with Would that, that language. Would that be a, a good change? Uh, Mr. Chairman, yes. uh, one observation, a question. We hear speakers here that are not out, not in Spotsylvania County. So, what's their voting district mean to us? Yeah, well, that's a great point. And I, I, uh, I like the address thing, but I'm not hard and fast with the, having to tell us where they live, or what voting district they're in. If it's if that's the information we need to have, that's fine. But I don't have any problem with one way or the other. I like to add an or. Okay. I, I think you give general support to, for the yeah. or. or. Okay. Uh, I, I support that. I just don't want us to get into a situation where we. Okay. Or. Yeah. <clears throat> any other questions or comments? Uh, I don't. Other than that, I don't have any comments. I think the uh, corrections are, are uh, you know, applicable. Um, so the next step is for you to come back with a. Uh, 
clean version clean for version. you to adopt. Yes. Yep. So we'll make that one change um, to make it an or for the address in the voting district. Very well. Anything else? That's all from staff. Um, under new business, um, I guess this is the appropriate place to discuss this. Um, we have in the uh, bylaws uh, the three committees that I referred to earlier, the Comprehensive Plan Committee, the Capital Improvements Committee, and the Development Review Committee. I would encourage my fellow commissioners to review each of those, and if you have a particular expertise or interest in one of those, please let me know. I would like to uh, get the assignments done um, by the end of the week um, so that uh, you know we have applications coming up where I think it's going to be very important. Uh, so if there's something that you uh, have a particular interest in or expertise in, please let me know. Otherwise, I'll make the assignments. And then, <clears throat> and then uh, I'll coordinate with you, Wanda, on um, staff support. Any other questions or comments on that or any other new business? Is there any public comment on anything that we did not discuss this evening? Hello, uh, my name is Dave Hammond. I live on uh, 11416 Seymour Lane in uh, Spotsylvania. I have some comments on the uh, solar project, and uh, there's actually three of us here who are going to talk uh, to a, we, we put together some notes you should have in front of you. Um, and we submitted, we're part of a group that submitted comments to uh, you last week, and hope, hopefully you all got your, com your copies of that document. If you didn't, uh, let us know. Um, we've, we've done some extensive research and have some uh, concerns that we voiced in the, in the statement. We want to make clear that we're not opposed to solar energy projects, um, but um, we, we want to make sure that utility scale energy plants are built and operated responsibly and to ensure that, it, that they do not inflict harm on people or the environment. And that, that's the point of our document and the point of us speaking tonight. So we have some uh, topics as we're doing our research. We came across some it's kind of eye-opening things we wanted to bring to your attention. So that's why we're talking to you tonight. Um, this thing is a massive scale. And, uh, you know, we, my wife and I looked through the DEQ website today, and it lists 73 projects, solar energy projects, that are being considered in Virginia. So this... So you see these all around. Um, all, all of the 73 are less than 150 megawatts. Um, in fact, only nine of them are 100 or 100 to 150 megawatts. So the vast majority of the projects you hear about are much less than 100 megawatts. There are a lot of 20 megawatt, that type of thing. This thing is 500 megawatts. So to put it in perspective, these are some of the, you know, oh my, I didn't realize that. It's hard to get your head around some of these numbers, so that's so I put these down here. This would be one of the largest solar plants in the world. It would be tied for 12th. This would be the fifth largest plant in the U.S., and all four of the larger plants are located in remote desert areas, away from people, you know, out isolated parts of the Mojave Desert in California, outside of Las Vegas, outside of Phoenix. So this thing is a monster. You know, and, and here, of course, we're, they're talking about putting it where our neighborhoods surround it. Um, solar panel, panels are placed on 6,350 acres. So what does that mean? Well, that's 10 square miles. That's the same size as the city of Fredericksburg or almost half of the size of Manhattan. So this is a massive thing. The largest solar energy facility on the East Coast right now is just over 100 megawatts. And in fact, the largest one in Virginia is 100 megawatts in Southampton, and that was just started up in December. So this is an unprecedented step out 
for the East Coast. It's unprecedented for Virginia. We don't know how this thing is going to impact us in these environment, in this environment. If you're out in the desert, fine, we have experience. In, in this environment in Virginia, we don't have a clue. So I'll, um, I'll move on quickly and then I'll, I'll hand off when my three minutes is up. But on water usage, this is one of the big concerns. This thing takes a lot of water. During construction, they, S Power says they need 308 million gallons of water during the 18 month construction period. This is, represents a 10% increase in the well water consumption in Spotsylvania, and, and that's on average. In reality, they're, they're going to be peak loads that are going to be 15 to 20% higher. Um, and when you look at the working days. My time is up. I'll respect your time limit and pass it off. Thank you. Okay, I'm Judy Janelle, and I live in Fawn Lake in the Livingston District, and I'm going to talk about the water usage rates. So S-Power proposes trucking in water wells or trucking in water due to the large requirements during construction. A semi-sized tanker truck holds about 9,000 gallons and weighs 80,000 pounds. Supplying 787,000 gallons every workday would require 87 maximum size tanker truck loads every workday for 18 months, over 34,000 loads on our roads. This would be in addition to the approximately 3,850 tractor trailer loads of solar panels, concrete, heavy equipment, and so forth. In addition, S Power states 8 million gallons per year is needed during operation for landscaping and panel washing. We think that the panels will have to be washed much more often than once a year, which was their calculation, given the pollen, pine sap, bugs, and birds that are prevalent in Virginia. Can you imagine washing your car's windshield just once a year? Monthly cleaning is more realistic, so water requirements will be 10 times more than their estimate. Excessive extraction of water from the new large capacity wells could lower groundwater levels and irreversibly damage the aquifer. There are over 1,000 households that depend on well water in the immediate vicinity of the project. Many of these residents report problems already with their wells during periods of drought. Further stress on the aquifer would exacerbate the problems requiring Spotsylvania County to spend millions of dollars to supply drinking water to these residents. Fawn Lake depends on the groundwater from several springs plus water from Greenfield Creek, and a reduction in groundwater levels could dry up the springs, which would reduce the lake level and make it unusable for recreation. In addition, the state is mandated, has mandated that we uh, supply farms downstream of Greenfield Creek below the dam of the lake. It would be devastating to Fawn Lake. We recommend an independent hydrogeological drilling study be performed uh, to determine if the required water extraction rates are feasible and sustainable. And we recommend, we understand the, the state will not limit the quantity of water that can be extracted since Sp Spotsylvania is not in a water management area. Any limitations on well water extraction rates must be included in the special use permit. And uh, we'd like due diligence is needed to assess the impact of building a world scale uh, solar power in the region. There's not been time to study the environmental impacts due to the large solar projects. Be uh, due to the large solar projects in Virginia, 50 to 100 megawatts, because we've only recently been, these have only recently been completed. Negative environmental impacts from increasingly larger solar plants in Virginia environment adjacent to res re residential neighborhoods should be carefully evaluated before we go to much larger ones. The impacts can be irreversible and devastating. Good evening, I'm Richard Janelle from um, 12,000 Fawn Lake Parkway, Spotsylvania. So uh, some of the other things that are left on the list here I'll cover very quickly. The solar heat island effect could significantly impact the local climate. Um, you know, as was said previously, most of these very large uh, solar panel farms have been built down in the middle of the desert. So now we're in a very different environment, lots of houses and, and um, properties around, and um, heating up the atmosphere around there could have an impact. 
uh, that would increase the temperature five to seven degrees. That's been shown on, on other uh, solar panel um, farms to do, and then could reduce rain by 20 percent. Uh, again, a due diligence uh, effort needs to be made to analyze what would be the impacts in the immediate area around um, uh, the site. Wherever possible, a county ordinance should be revised to ensure that adverse consequences are avoided or mitigated. In addition, the special use permit should provide specific constraints and requirements for the project to avoid harming residents, wildlife, or the environment. As power is trying to make Spotsylvania County the guinea pigs that will find out about the potentially serious impacts of building such a large scale solar energy plant on the East Coast. We need to do our due diligence to ensure we can live with the consequences. And the last comment I want to make is um, in the process of doing our research, we have contacted a number of people working in the planning staff and other offices here in the building and they've been very helpful to us in terms of understanding um, what the ordinances are about and policies and so forth and we very much do appreciate that. Thank you. My name is uh, Lester Gabriel. Actually, I'm from uh, Stafford County, the Gale Precinct, um, but I do have a lot of friends in, um, in Spotsylvania I'm working on this uh, particular project with. Uh, I won't repeat uh, some of the things already been said about the uh, unique status of this power plant in terms of its size and its location um, in residential area um, and on a, a uh, environment that differs very significantly from other large plants in the U.S. Uh, in terms of uh, soil, <coughs> um, plant and animal life, and, uh, and the human environment. The risks involved with a 500 megawatt uh, facility cannot be d determined by multiplying the risks of a 100 me megawatt project by five. The risks in many cases are not linear, but rather um, exp exponential. Compounding <coughs> the scale problem is that of runoff in an area that is subject to many times the average annual rainfall compared to the large other large facilities and uh, the amount of silt and uh, erosion that would be caused especially because of the likelihood of heavy downpours causing runoff and groundwater problems in newly deforested areas um, I would urge uh, the Commission to talk to other planning commissions in nearby counties uh, such as Culpeper Essex, St. George, and Orange that have dealt with these problems on a smaller scale, and Spotsylvania should learn from their experiences. Thank you. My name is Michael O'Bear, 11201 Chancellor Meadows Lane. And my concern is that the uh, gate number one for the new so solar project, I know it's in the proposal stages, but at the end of, end of uh, Chancellor Meadows Lane, there are six uh, school grade kids that get on off the school bus during the peak uh, traffic time for the solar field. There'll be, this year, be two in elementary school, two in middle school, and two in high school, which covers almost the whole uh, traffic area time to, for the construction traffic. Um, and I brought this up to the school board and everybody at a plant, the, uh, um, and you know it has to be brought up now before it goes goes too far and uh, I think it would be a health hazard to the kids if they're trying to get on and off the bus with the uh, traffic coming in not just the construction traffic but the uh, equipment the um, tractor trailers bringing in supplies it's all gonna be coming down that one road with the kids getting on and off the school bus thank you
I'm Sharon Brill. I live in the Livingston District. And I would just urge the commission to consider what the short-term benefits yield in terms of long-term degradation to the county. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to speak? Very well. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I'm Lester Lamer. I live in the middle of the plan on West Catharpin Road, and I urge you to check that that land is not perkable, which means any runoff run will be definitely into your streams and downstream. Anyone else? All right, very well. Uh, not seeing anybody. I appreciate the comments. Um, any other questions or comments from the commissioners? At this point, I'll take a uh, motion to adjourn. So moved. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you very much. <laughs>